Hi, and welcome. Um, my name is Bunny Ellerin, and I run New York City Health Business Leaders. Uh, so today's discussion, why so many of you have uh, jumped on, is about healthcare investment trends. Uh, where will the money flow in 2022? So now um, I would like to introduce my uh, partner in crime for today's session, Bill Carey. He's a partner at Deloitte and um, is the tri-state health tech lead. Um, he works with a lot of digital health companies. Thank you, Bonnie. Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for having me. All right, so now on to the main event. Um, we would like you to meet our panelists. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for being part of today. Uh, what we want is to just have you each briefly introduce yourselves and kind of you know, what areas you, you know, focus on and stage, and then we will get right into the Q&A. So, Brenton, why don't we start with you? Thanks, Bonnie. Happy to, to be here in my apartment, but I've been joined by <laughs> all of you virtually. Uh, Brenton Farnioli, I am a physician. I spent a bunch of time at Flatiron Health, and now I lead Alley Corp's Healthcare Fund. We're a $100 million fund investing primarily in digital health and New York City-based companies, and so Really appreciate the partnership with New York City Health Business Leader over the years. Great, Jared, would you like to go next? Sure, um, welcome uh, everybody and, and thanks for letting me join. Um, uh, Jared Kesselheim here, like Brett and I'm a internal medicine doc by training and then I've been doing uh, kind of novel health tech and novel health services investing for about 14 years now. Um, the most recent six of which have been uh, building and running transformation capital uh, we are a dedicated digital health growth equity fund uh, now investing out of a, a $500 million fund too. Um, so we typically make kind of 10 to $50 million investments in revenue stage digital health companies. That can be a little bit of revenue. That can be a lot. It uh, doesn't matter anywhere in between uh, kind of one in a hundred million uh, in companies that are software or tech enabled services or novel clinic or insurance models selling into uh, any uh, healthcare uh, stakeholder as an end customer. And then um, given the whole team comes from healthcare, you know, try to be great active minority partners to be as helpful as we can be. Excellent. Thanks, Jared. Uh, Laura, over to you. Great. And great to be here. Laura Verano, partner with Optum Ventures. Uh, I've been here since we were founded about four and a half years ago. At Optum Ventures, we manage about a billion dollars and we invest in an affiliated way with United Health Group. We have about 50 companies in our portfolio and look at the market pretty stage agnostically, trying to look at the best possible opportunities to bring our healthcare expertise, contacts, uh, commercial connectivity into the companies that we invest in across the spaces that we find most relevant to um, to our sole LP, which is United Health Group. So you will find us doing everything from sort of insurance innovation through to touching most of the Optum businesses across care delivery, data analytics, and technology more broadly. Great to be here. Thank you, Laura. And last but not least, Pete. Thank you, Billy. I appreciate it. Uh, so Pete Meek, I lead our uh, I help tech technology practice uh, here at Deloitte, advising uh, many emerging growth companies um, that kind of in the vortex of convergence between healthcare and technology, advising them through their life cycle. I'm happy to really support Bunny. And what I think is a fantastic initiative to showcase really the power, the emerging power of New York and the tri-state area from a, from a health technology and, and industry perspective. Well, thank you for that. And thank, and thank all four of you for giving your time today. Um, so I'm going to start with the obvious. Um, as we talked about earlier, there's been a lot of money um, being invested in healthcare over the past 18 months. Obviously, COVID had something to do with that. But it, you know, particularly digital health, right, has exploded. Um, and so, what are things looking like in 2022? Are we going to see the same magnitude of investment? Are we going to see the same valuations? Are things are things still flowing as freely? And if they are, you know, where are things, you know, what are you most excited about and seeing where the money is going? So Laura, why don't we start with you and then our friends can jump in. 
I'm sure we will have a ton of opinions on this one. And um, I think we are in a transformational so. moment right now. So I'll, I'll give you my thoughts to start. I think um, I think Bunny hit on this well at the start, looking at sort of the, the New York market. And I think a lot of the numbers and the growth that you've seen have been mirrored in the rest of the country as well. So I think everybody knows the numbers at this point, 2019, something like $7 billion going into innovation and healthcare, digital health overall. We were shocked by the $14 billion number in 2020. And then, you know, the numbers come out closer to 30 billion in 2021. So a huge focus in, in healthcare, digital health overall, larger deal sizes, more deals, and at least a perceived maturation or a comfortability in putting more money into the, the companies and categories that we're seeing in the space. We could probably talk for five hours about why that all came together and a mix of things like new liquidity pathways, enabling you know different, different types of pathways for these companies, new entrants from a, from a fund perspective and broader sort of VC landscape perspective, larger funds raised overall, even on the healthcare side, but ultimately just a ton of interest, a ton of innovation, a lot of entrepreneurs coming into the category. I think what, what we've seen happen in the last quarter or so is um, what everyone has observed in the public markets, the companies that mirrored a lot of the valuations that we were seeing in the private side, at least um, at an abstract level, have had a massive pullback. So you have you have companies in the insur insurance innovation space or services space or behavioral space or telehealth space that in many instances are under maybe 50% of the price they were at at the peak during COVID. And I think we've definitely started to see that translate into the, the private, particularly growth stage uh, overall. I think, Jared, you kind of pointed this out before. Um, it, I don't think it's that public to everybody yet because we see it through deals we're looking at. We see it through portfolio companies. And if you look at the you know newswire right now, you will see a lot of rounds getting announced from maybe a couple of quarters ago. So I think it'll take a while for it to be obvious exactly what's happening out there. But for us, um, a lot of activity on the early stage side and a lot more conservatism and maybe structure and thoughtfulness on more of the growth side of things. With all of that said, like the fundamentally good companies and strong companies that look more like platforms, we're seeing a lot of access to capital companies, companies like TruePill or Dispatch or, um, or others, you know, across the space that really look like platforms and really look like uh, technology enabled. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, folks in the category. So I will pause there and let others others jump in. Yeah, I mean, if I could just add to that briefly, I mean, what gets funded in healthcare are solutions, right? You know, organizations that are solving for access, affordability, dealing with social determinants of health and health equity uh, get funded, solutions get funded. And, you know, the reality is um, the demand for solutions and technology in this industry still far exceed the supply. Uh, and, you know, you think about kind of evaluations over the last year, I think they're more indicative of the macroeconomic environment and less about, you know, the true need in healthcare for solutions and technology. Um, there will be companies that, you know, don't meet expectations. Um, that, that always happens. But, you know, our view is that as long as the, the supply exceeds the demand, um, you know, companies will get funded. Yeah, I can hop, hop, in, hop in here from the very early stage perspective, right? We start companies are often the first investors. And really at that stage, you know, venture capital is following talent, uh, not, not the other way around. And there's tremendous talent right now in the digital health sphere. I haven't seen this in, in our, our careers. And it's coming from multiple avenues, right? So you have people from outside of healthcare who have been touched by the pandemic, inspired to do something about healthcare and fix healthcare, and uh, they're joining the fray. You have more and more folks who have been part of unicorns or digital health exits. They've seen it done. They now want to be founders or founding team members. I think there's three or four uh, former Flatiron colleagues of mine we've invested in. Um, there's many folks from Brigham and Women's who've joined companies uh, as chief medical officers. And that's really the third, the third avenue where people who have worked in academia or health systems, payers, providers, they're seeing what's happening in, in the startup world and they want to get involved. And so I think that bodes well for the capital to continue flowing. And then as we looked at the benchmark of, wow, it's, it's unbelievable how much it's increased. 
we have a lot of catch up to do. Um, you know, the 20% figure of 9 billion to 50 billion on healthcare venture capital in New York, you know, healthcare is 20% of the US economy. So we're, we're kind of just getting back to, uh, to average and there's just so much potential with the transformation happening with value-based care that I think we're gonna to continue to, to see it uh, accelerate. Well, well, valuations in the mid, late public markets go down a little bit, up a little bit. I don't know, but I think you're gonna to continue to see a lot of capital flowing flowing into this this year and over the coming years. So, Jared, the next question is gonna to come to you and we can continue on this topic specifically. And, and Laura touched on it a little bit as well. But whether you're looking at series C, A, B, the, the magnitude of the funding in each of the stages has changed. Right? On the surface, it seems risky that you're giving a young, unproven company, in some cases, very large sums of money. But there's clearly something attractive that's commanding $50, $100 million around. So why are we seeing this? And do you believe it's sustainable? Or, well, well, the first thing I'd say is that I do think that these kinds of larger, um, earlier stage rounds are in addition to the kinds of seed and Series A rounds that we used to see, not, not necessarily replacing that, right? We led a Series A investment in a, a business called Vital that is run by the former founder of Mint.com and has an amazing uh, kind of patient experience tool for emergency rooms, right? You know, that was a, you know, sub $20 million dollar Series A in a business that already had traction, uh, you know, in, in a number of hospitals. Um, we led another Series A investment recently. We haven't announced yet, so we won't talk about it here. We don't want to get ahead of their PR, but you know, that's a Series A and again a business um, um, that has a little bit of revenue, you know, has some revenue traction, but where the round itself, uh, you know, is, is a you know, sub ten million dollar total round that that we were the majority of. So those kinds of rounds, I think, are still happening um, in interesting and exciting businesses. But what you're also seeing is exactly the premise of this question, these very large seeds, very large series A's. Um, and I do think we're going to continue to see more of them. Uh, and I think the, the contributing factors to that are, you know, it starts with this is still a great market, as I think Brenton kind of highlighted at the end, like we've got a long way to go to solve all the problems in healthcare. And the recent exits, both on the M&A and the IPO side, have shown that you can build very large companies. You know, yes. Multiples have compressed, but uh, you know that doesn't mean these aren't meaningful businesses that should be public and, and should have meaningful market cap. So the path to getting an, an exit will, you know, allows you to do some of these larger earlier stage rounds and see, um, that will inherently have some some higher post money valuations and see the path to um, you know to to a return. Um, and then I I think the other two contributing factors one uh, Brent mentioned as well, but is like as you have great teams. Um, that are starting companies, they'll be able to attract that kind of capital early on. Um, and, you know, as much as uh, obviously I, I love this market, I've bet my professional career on it, it still has some, you know, occasionally some slow sales cycles as these large enterprises are trying to move the, uh, you know, kind of change the direction on their aircraft carrier. And so I do think there's a, you know, a business benefit to funding these companies to, allow, to, to give them, you know, a bit more extended runway um, to nail a product market fit. You know, and get some real evidence inside some of these uh, these very large enterprises. So, um, and then the last piece is, that I think contributes is a um, you know is related to a point a point Laura made around you know larger funds um, uh, putting capital into this sector. And so, if you're going to have you know a billion or two billion dollar fund doing digital health investing um, and wanting to uh, not necessarily do everything at a post you know billion dollar valuation then they're going to go earlier. And if they're going to go earlier, they can't do it with a five or $10 million check. So they're going to do it with a $50 million check. Um, uh, and so you're going to see a few more of those as well. I'll maybe just jump in to, to add on to one of the points made. And I think Brenton and team have, have done this a bit at Alley Corp as well, but you do see a lot of innovation at the sort of startup studio level as well. So a lot of large rounds, and Jared hit on this, um, it's repeat entrepreneurs who have track records and, and relationships and team building capabilities that uh, is a little bit different than maybe what we have seen previously because we've only just cycled through probably the first real wave of interesting companies like Brad Smith has and Adam Bowler and others in the category. So 
um, you know, early stage, yes, but deeply experienced and deeply um, networked in the in the space more broadly to speed up hopefully those sales cycles that Jared talked about is I think another component of some of the larger rounds coming out of coming out of some of those places. I guess I would ask a, a question because you're talking about repeat founders, but at least when I look at some of the really big money um, that's gone to New York startups, these are first time founders. They haven't had a they haven't had a company before. So is there some risk in investing that much in still fairly unproven entities? I, we invest a lot in first time founders. Right. And I would just add, they've often operated at, um, you know, whether it's an Oscar or a Flatiron or City Block, and they've operated so well and they have a followership within that company. They weren't necessarily the CEO. And so this is the next step in their career progression. Uh, so you're seeing a lot of that, which um, are commanding some of these rounds versus, you know, the founder of that unicorn now starting another thing. That certainly uh, is going to be a large round, but you're also seeing the, the trickle down to the, the deputies who have excelled in those environments. And uh, everyone knows which deputies those are um, because they've worked, worked alongside them. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, a lot of the new founders have significant operating experience in healthcare. And, and that's what it takes to solve the big issues. Uh, healthcare is complex. It, it is not easy. There's a third party payer system. There are you know, multiple touch points in the supply chain. And having that kind of nitty gritty operating experience is helpful. And I think that coupled with the ability to build teams, talent, and likely most importantly, focusing on a solution, right? I mean. I think the solution trumps trumps all. If you, if you have um, a technology based platform or solution you know, that that deals with the pending issues in healthcare, um, people will invest because it you know healthcare is is sloppy, it's complex, and we have a ways to go. I think I don't think there's a perfect formula for a team. The team is extremely important, but we have examples of deeply experienced repeat founders or to Brenton's point, I don't think necessarily like founder, but, you know, uh, leader inside of a past startup with deep operational experience at that level, others who come from incumbents, uh, but you also have the first time founders, Jared and, and I are both in, let's get checked, someone like a Peter Foley, who I would probably put up against anyone to go after a category like lab testing, which is extremely hard to think about, especially a few years ago, thinking about a pretty incumbent dominated industry. And so I, th I think it's hard to think about it as a perfect formula of has to be this way or another, another way. I think it's very dependent on uh, the space that somebody's going after and what they can sort of aggregate from a team perspective and in different pieces. So we don't, we don't have a bias in one way or another in that respect. That, that's fair enough. Um, you know, talking about new models, um, obviously over the past you know, 18 months, uh, digital first care is now, you know, a pretty common refrain, right? At least among us, I don't know in the general public, although we have seen a movement towards more individuals post COVID still using virtual care. So people always talk about, is it gonna be virtual only, footprint only, you know, when, now that we're getting a little bit more mature, um, when you're looking at an investment in a digital first company, are you are you also looking to make sure that they're gonna have some sort of footprint, like a physical footprint? Um, or is that not all that relevant? I'm just trying to unpack what's going on when, in terms of seeing providers. Brenton, maybe we could start with you. Yeah, I mean, I look at it in our team, we have a number of clinicians on our team. We, we look at it first from that clinical standpoint of, does this actually work? Uh, Ideally, does it work better than the stand, substantially better than the standard of care and it's good for patients and start from that premise and you have to think about what the population you're treating is, what the condition is. There are some conditions that are physical in nature, uh, the intervention, and there's going to need to be a footprint of some sort or a, a physical workforce. And then I think we've seen others, whether it's mental health, physical therapy with the innovation and remote monitoring and others that have been prone to 
uh, virtual only models. And so, you know, we're starting first with does it work and then trying to find the teams that are bringing an efficient, scalable model to, to that. And some conditions are, you know, more prone in this cycle of innovation than others to that efficient, scalable model. And really looking for the teams that, that can bring those two things together that it works and can work at scale. Um, but it's very easy to do things that can scale well, but don't work. And also really easy to do things that can work really well with absolutely no scale. And so the magic is uh, finding it along that, along that continuum. I guess, I mean, I'll add, um, you know, I think we, we have more investments that when, uh, for investments we've made that do clinical delivery, you know, we have taken more of an approach of, of looking for, you know, trying to back sort of omni-channel platforms, right? So that, uh, that at the end of the day can, um, take care of the patients that can be taken care of clinically effectively in a virtual setting virtually. And if it needs uh, for either the type of uh, clinical condition or the type of patient, you know, needs would be better done in person or it starts in person and then moves to virtual, you know, after certain criteria are reached, uh, you know, that, that we have those capabilities. So uh, uh, Laura and I also work together on a company called Groups, which we think is a leader uh, in, um, in, take, in kind of taking on the opioid, opioid e epidemic. Uh, and it, it is a business that, that you know, at its heart uh, originally was a physical footprint and, and certainly always had a plan to add in digital capabilities uh, and virtual capabilities. Um, COVID only accelerated, you know, their, their approach to that. Um, but I do think it's it's the combination of both that allows them to uh, I think be the the, the best possible uh, solution for you know for, for the members who need them and for the the payers that they partner with to say hey you know you know we can really help um, you know a broad section of, of your members uh, from you know uh, across ages across demographics because we have both these capabilities. You know, similarly on the primary care side, um, you know, we're investors in a company called Vera Whole Health that runs value-based primary care clinics. Um, uh, this is this is public. They're in the process of of taking Castlight uh, private and merging the two companies together and adding in that technology. Um, and again, sort of a similar story to to groups of like historically a physical footprint. You know, lean forward on technology and virtual offering, and now has the ability to offer both, which I think serves them you know serves them well as they try to partner with. Uh, payers and employers um, who, you know, may have members and employees that are 25 and pretty healthy and, and used to doing everything on their iPhone and can be taken care of nearly exclusively virtually and may have people near the end of their careers, you know, who aren't yet uh, quite so comfortable or have enough, you know, comorbidities and, uh, and chronic conditions that um, they're going to have to go see somebody in person, you know, for, uh, for, for some of them and, you know, and may be able to do virtual for, for others. Great. So shifting a little, uh, and Pete, we can move over to you. It seems likely that we'll see some consolidation in 2022. For example, 30 Madison just acquired NERCs. Can you comment on the current M&A environment and where you think the most traction will be? Yeah, so it's really interesting, right? If you look at the telehealth market kind of at the beginning, even before COVID, right, there were a lot of barriers that prevented that subsector from, from really optimizing its capabilities. Um, COVID brought a lot of those barriers down and in a very short period of time, you know, consolidated into, you know, four or five major players, the, you know, large market participants joined the fray. Um, and so I think all organizations kind of recognize they need those capabilities. Um, but when you look at the, and there'll always be M&A, right, for organizations that look to fill their specific needs. But M&A um, can be expensive. M&A can take time. Um, and there are you know, specific barriers that, that make M&A truly accretive to a business in an environment that uh, puts a premium on speed. And so our point of view, and we actually have a piece coming out soon around uh, ecosystems and alliances where we believe that there will be more and more partnering between uh, emerging companies in the space and existing uh, both healthcare and non-healthcare market participants as they look to you know, complement those capabilities. They could take the form of you know, alliances, joint ventures, you know, risk sharing arrangements, 
we think that's going to be a healthy component of kind of the overall, you know, environment around M and A, you know, over the next few years. I'm sure that three of you have something to say about consolidation. I, I can jump in and. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I mean, it's one of the most interesting things to watch right now. Yeah. We've had enough comments about like valuation changes and um, and also, you know, the capital that's sitting in the hands of some of the sort of category platform plays in the market. I think whether we're talking about, you know, interest of companies like 30 Madison and, and Generax or, or thinking about incumbents in the space or thinking about, you know, totally other entities out there. I think it's going to be a really interesting moment for consolidation um, because of the macro dynamics of what has happened in the market. There's also just, I feel like a constant pendulum swing of wanting more innovation and more specialization and, and a push from various different stakeholders, including consumers in the market. Um, but we're at a moment right now where the number of silos and the consumer experience, whether you're talking about an employer channel, a payer channel, or a direct to consumer channel, frankly, is overwhelming right now. And so I, I expect to see, particularly in behavioral health, where we have seemingly like 300,000 companies right now, um, I, I expect to see some interesting moves played in the next, you know, 12, 24 months from all types of stakeholders in the space from incumbents through to, to well-capitalized startups out there. Totally agree on, on behavioral health, especially that sector where it's a limited supply that is a problem. And so there's going to be consolidation around that. And then as you move from mental health to layering in substance use uh, horizontally, I think we'll see a lot of that. But I worry about it, right? So M&A is usually pretty ugly. Um, you can end up with a Frankenstein product, the talent, the talent heads for the door. Um, and so that it could be precarious as we just think about what digital health looks like if it's going to become very prevalent. My hope is we see some incredible marketplaces form, right? Where... Yes, the go-to-market channel is saturated, but there are some great point solutions that are focused doing good work and that they're able to uh, continue to stand alone and thrive as more marketplaces come, come to bear aggregating, uh, whether that's supply or, or demand. So well, I, th I think we'll see both of those, but um, M&A isn't easy, uh, nor, nor typically fun over the long term. Are there any particular areas that people should be, you know, focusing on in terms of M&A? Like, is it going to be horizontal, vertical? Are you going to see the incumbents um, acquiring some of the startups? If you do have a new class of buyers, which are the companies that have been able to, to you know, sort of the first big wave of digital health companies getting um, getting public and having that currency uh, to support their M&A efforts. And, um, you know, we've already seen them be active. Signify has been active in M&A. Uh, Health Catalyst has been active in M&A. Um, you know, a number of these others, and, and they will continue to, to be so. Um, and, and I think, you know, given the trends in, in healthcare, you're going to continue to see interest from larger players outside of healthcare, uh, looking to have it be a bigger piece of their p l and and will be you know making large deals on on kind of choice assets. I think we're talking about sort of two different aspects of m a, the like all of the positive trends in our sector that are going to lead you know big companies outside of healthcare or partially healthcare or in healthcare that are large to to buy uh, the best businesses and then sort of defensive m a and consolidation where, in a market that uh, is more punishing to hybrid businesses, um, you can't have, to, to Laura's number, sort of 300,000 point solutions in behavioral health, all be 300,000 point solutions in behavioral health yeah, 18 months from now. And, and those need, you know, the, there, there will need to be a shakeout there um, um, that will be, I think, kind of more defensive consolidation uh, um, that allows some of these companies to um, uh, combine and, uh, you know, extract synergies and survive. And I think M and A is obviously very distracting and not always not always executed well, and talent's hard to hold on to and everything like that. But when done right, can be pretty transformational. I think Jared, I feel like you guys are in Ginger. Maybe like the Headspace Ginger move was beautiful in my perspective. Like beautiful consumer brand on the Headspace side, great enterprise traction on the Ginger side. I'm sure tough behind the scenes to think about how to integrate the different pieces there, but. 
there's a lot of examples. We have a lot of examples in our portfolio, like able to enjoyable, like there, there's really, really um, interesting ways that, that these types of transactions can be transformational. Brent and I totally agree most of the time it's not, and it's done uh, poorly and talents out the door and things like that. But we, we have the benefit of watching probably the biggest aggregator ever in healthcare in Optum, who has grown in many ways by a lot of, a lot of different inorganic pathways over the years. And um, there, there is power in, in the opportunity around m and I think for both, you know, the first wave of great healthcare innovators, I think here, like Jared pointed out, and also for the broader, broader industry. Great. So let's do one more question before we go towards the audience questions. And that is uh, the, the coin term, the great resignation that we're seeing uh, within the talent pool. Employee retention right now is a very big concern across all industries. What are some of the types of strategies that your portfolio companies are using to stay ahead uh, as it relates to this? And this is open-ended, so everyone can jump in. There are different tactics, right? Virtual poker night, on-sites, off-sites, varies by company. But I think fundamentally, it's can you instill uh, with your coworkers a sense of caring, caring about each other personally, caring about your customers, which often is called mission, but truly caring. Um, that is, is hard to instill, especially in a, in a virtual world. And so, you know, teams are employing these different tactics, whether it's let's go shadow uh, at a clinic or... Let's have um, people participate in customer support with, with patients, um, things, of, things of that nature to really get close to the customer and close with coworkers that otherwise is rather distant in, um, in our currently virtual world. And hopefully uh, we'll be returning to, to offices, at least in some hybrid capacity more and more going forward, which, which will help. But I think it's really that sense of caring. And of course, compensation has to remain competitive but that's a kind of a transactional table stakes and mechanism for it. Yeah, well, this, this is a healthcare world, right? I mean, these are healthcare companies. So you, there's inherently, you know, hopefully an ability to, uh, to get everybody aligned around a mission of, of impact, which I think is, is much more the case than, you know, if, if this was a business making, you know, ads on the web, like 1% more effective or, or, or something like that. So the, the you know, but, but, you know, besides that, um, you know, at, at least from from our side of the table as an investor, like it's it, the the reality is this is happening, and so can we find a way to make an investment thesis out of it? And so whether you know we're invested in a, a marketplace for nurse staffing uh, called CareRev, that's a, a kind of per DM nurse staffing for for health systems, um, where one of the tailwinds for this business is the great resignation that that's taking place. So. Um, there's, I guess, some silver linings on it from an investor perspective, but I, uh, you know, certainly I, I empathize with the leaders of our companies who are, um, you know, having to, to handle it across the board. I mean, I think being able to communicate the mission is really important. I, you know, healthcare has some advantages, right, in terms of it being very personal and organizations that can, you know, capture that kind of sentiment around, look, this is, this is real, this is personal. Uh, it's not a sleepy industry that's that's lagging, uh, as was the perception for you know for years. And I think COVID has brought to light a lot of those issues, whether it be around mental health or access or you know health equity and you know being able to convey. I think there's a Forbes article around you know do you want to make an impact in tech? You know go to healthcare, um, which seemed counterintuitive you know just a few years ago, but but I now I think you know, kind of aligns with what we're seeing in the broader, you know, the broader market and the broader society. And so being, a, being able to balance the social and commercial aspects of this business and, and those that can do that in a pretty empathetic way, I think, you know, will succeed in attracting talent because the emerging generation wants to have an impact. They, they want to have an impact to society and, you know, where to do that better, frankly, than in healthcare. Yeah, I, I agree with all of that. It, it sounds, um, it can sound soft in some ways, but especially as a company grows, um, it's very hard to have everybody sort of aligned in the same direction and have everybody's, everybody's sort of KPIs aligned to a, 
to a specific goal that is easy to understand and works across everything from engineering to other places. And some companies have an easier time with the, the clarity of the mission than others, um, especially some of the care delivery companies compared to maybe like an infrastructure company or somebody like that. But I think that clear articulation of almost like a North Star for a company that that helps, you know, at various stages there um, to just echo what everybody said. I think the other piece is, I forget which coach at some point said this in a quote, but winning is also very important to the growth, actually being successful in the company. Um, there's a lot of attention paid to that. And there's, it's easy to jump from company to company in the current environment. So I think, um, I think there's a lot of pressure on, on companies from all different angles, including employees to actually have, you know, high, high growth and a winning group around the table, including the investors you're able to pull in. And I do think, um, I do think that part of the culture is in this current environment for better or worse, a big, a big component of the calculus. Okay, well, we better get some winners, right? Um, although I, there are a bunch in the market. So we have so many questions. Uh, so we're gonna start taking questions now. Um, I can guarantee we're not gonna get to all of them, but we'll try and get to a bunch. All right, so first up is Nima Ruhi. And Nima, tell us who, you know, where you're calling in from or you know, what, you're, what you do quickly and then ask your question. Sure, thanks a lot. I appreciate the opportunity uh, and, and thank you for to the panel for this great discussion. I'm Nima Ruhi, based in New York City, co-founder and CEO of Blooming Health, uh, focused on the, um, basically aging in place and healthy aging in place space. Um, um, so the question I have is, is basically around the social determinants of health. COVID has emboldened the importance of SDOH impact on health outcomes, especially for older adults and the need to digitize the uh, bridge between SDOH and healthcare. Um, there's been some success stories over the past few years with companies like City Block Health and Unite Us. Uh, I was wondering what the panel thinks in general about investment in this space um, and, 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 in, in, and what are some of the criteria or, or problems basically they are looking for to be solved and the criteria around investment in those uh, problems basically. Um, I guess I'll uh, happy to start, uh, you know, so, so I'd say, um, I guess I, I continue to think there's going to be more here because we've, we've found ways to align economic incentives with incentives around doing the right thing by SDOH. Um, we're in uh, full disclosure, we're investors in, in Unite Us. We think that's a, a fantastic business and doing an incredible amount of good. Um, but this is, you know, the hard part of healthcare is figuring out where, you know, to the name of this, of, of kind of this, this whole session, like where does the money flow and how does it flow and when will it flow? And can you find business models um, that, that work with how the money flows? Uh, and fortunately, I do think that the market continues to move in a direction um, where doing, uh, you know, focusing on SDOH, you know, the, that value can be um, shared among the buyer and the seller of the technology uh, company and, and its customers in a way that um, uh, helps both companies and, and helps the, the, you know, the ultimately the patient. Um, the, you know, I think there's outside of City Block and Unite Us, there's a ton of businesses that have elements of this and, you know, they're not called SDOH companies, but like it's part of their business model. There's, uh, you know, for-profit pace businesses, uh, you know, Wellbe Health or Innovage on the, on the public side, like a lot of what a PACE model does is around the social determinants for those, um, you know, for, for, for their members. Uh, and, you know, you might not think of it necessarily as SDOH, but, but that's what it is. And there's a, you know, a ton of new businesses coming up, um, you know, that have elements of, all right, you know, how do we meet people where they are outside of the four walls of a clinic uh, that touch on these issues? So I do think there's going to be more capital continuing to head this direction. It just might not be called, S, you know, SDOH specifically. Yeah, I agree. I mean, there's, I mean, there are, there are health plans that have various discrete activities around uh, trying to create those incentives and, and aligning the consumer to participate. Um, you know, one of the challenges is, you know, getting consumers to kind of understand the importance of some of those aspects, right? And how it can not only um, 
be a cost saving to them, but can actually accelerate you know, therapeutic outcomes. Um, and so I think awareness and education is a big, big part of um, you know, meeting the consumer where they are. It's, you know, we, we hear that a lot. You can meet them there, but getting them to kind of do the things that are important uh, for their own health um, and for their own cost savings, you know, you know, can continue to be a challenge. Um, I think companies that are able to execute against that and understand human behavior uh, will be most successful. Okay. Well, we have another. Um... Oh, no, I, I'm sorry, I got the wrong person. Um, I'll ask it. Uh, this is from, from Steve. How do you think about employer benefits landscape evolving with so many new point solutions um, on the market for relatively new benefits? So what, yeah, I mean, they're all going after the employers. Everybody is going after employers now. So how do you see that evolving? I can jump in. I think what we've seen, and this is a little bit of the pendulum swing I was talking about earlier. I think 2017 timeframe, you had a lot of a lot of um, demands from employers for payers, for example, to move quicker uh, from an innovation standpoint. And I think the digital health landscape kind of picked up picked up the the ask there and and ran with it. But I think what we've seen what we've seen be really effective in the market is actually using the direct to employer types of relationships more of a more as an agitator to the actual the actual payers in the market so you get some of the jumbo accounts out there really interested in what you're doing if you're hitting the market at a time where there's huge needs behavioral health pediatric health um, women's health whatever it might be uh, those those voices start to carry really heavy weight in in the market and then I think it creates an interesting opportunity to actually get on what's probably a more sustainable business model of being on payer rails and being distributed across a large book of ASO clients, fully insured clients, et cetera. So we're hearing both from, I'd say, the investor community and seeing through our portfolio companies um, that ability to jump onto those payer rails, ultimately to serve the employers in a way that's maybe more scalable than employer to employer, which eventually sort of taps out. Um, is probably where we're where we're currently at in that sort of pendulum swing in the market. Yeah, I mean, you look at you know large large employers that self insure, right? They they still have the most incentives, right, to to try to take advantage of these capabilities beyond just cost savings, right? I mean, many of them are looking at it as a retention tool, attraction of retention tool in today's today's environment. Employers um, and ultimately the government, even though there's been some cost you know, cost shifting to consumers, ultimately employers, you know, still are picking up the most significant component of the healthcare tab, and so um, they have the financial incentives to do it. And I think you'll you'll continue to see emerging companies target you know those organizations as customers in this evolving market. Okay. All right. Up next, we have Rosemary Dorset. Um, Rosemary, will are you unmuted? Yes. Hi. Uh, you had a really interesting question. Tell us where you're from, and and then ask your question. Hi there. Um, I'm Rosemary Dorset. I currently work at Area 23, an IPG health company in um, the healthcare advertising and marketing space. Um, my question was about, I had two questions. So Bunny, I'm not sure if you're referring to one or another. The, yeah, the one about duplicative. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. So um, it I'm just one because like we have a lot of people. <laughs> completely. So I'll ask this one. Thanks for clarifying. So the boom in health tech innovation is really exciting, um, but it does feel from my perspective, there are a lot of duplicative solutions being funded and developed. And I think that you guys touched on um, some mergers and acquisitions that were going on for complementary services or platforms. Um, I'm just wondering about how we can prioritize and ensure that um, urgent unmet needs are being funded and get the opportunities to help 
those that are on the front lines of healthcare day to day or help patient populations that are underserved, underfunded, but increasing in numbers. And I'm just thinking about specific CNS conditions that we're seeing diagnoses rise over time due to different considerations, likely environmental, um, that we're going to have to deal with in the long term um, and how some of these solves can can get the dollars and the talent um, and the time to shine. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Jared. Oh, sure. You know, I mean, I still think ultimately, like, it, it is about money flows and like where the opportunities are. Like, in my, I guess my view is like we're seeing a lot of Me Too companies, but those Me Too companies are going after the, you know, the the problems that have the biggest economic opportunity, you know, associated with them, which you know, hopefully has some meaningful overlap with the biggest problems and pain points of, of the various, you know, end customers. Um, you know, so you're going to see more going after behavioral health or more going after cardiology or more going after diabetes, you know, than you are going to see, uh, you know, going after uh, you know, potentially, I guess, to, to one, of, you know, one of the examples in your question, like a CNS, you know, disease that may have a you know, smaller patient, you know, population associated uh, with it. Um, I guess, given sort of where we are in the evolution of the market, like, I'm just very happy that there's a lot of opportunity for digital health to go after these big problems first. Like, there may be a subsequent phase where, you know, we need to find some other, um, you know, economic incentives, you know, the, the, uh, you know, like, like has happened analogously on the drug side where, you know, policies can come in place that can help motivate. All right, well, if you develop a drug in, uh, you know, uh, an, a new antibiotic in some area that's going to have a small market, then you'll get some benefits somewhere else in your drug development pathway for, you know, uh, to be able to get a faster review. Like, again, but that's a market that's much more mature than digital health, where, where those kinds of levers have been able to come into play to kind of guide dollars toward underdeveloped areas. Like we're still in very much the first phase of this market and you're seeing the kind of the biggest problems um, by number of kind of patients and dollars get the most attention from digital health solutions. And you're seeing a lot of V2 solutions around the same big ones because uh, they see the opportunity to go in and, and capture kind of a lot of economic value. Yeah. Yeah. I think Laura said it best, right? I mean, success does breed success. We're going to need, we're going to need some significant winners in this, you know, very, you know, market that's in its infancy. I mean, digital health is still in its infancy. Um, I think as, as we get success stories in organizations that are solving some, some of the more significant issues in healthcare, I think, uh, you know, founders and innovation, will over time, you know, evolve into meeting those un unmet needs. I think it's a great point. Um, I think we can't lose sight of the fact that we're still in the, you know, we're still in the first inning, right? Uh, in, in many ways. Yeah, and just-, just oh, Go ahead, Martin. Thanks a lot. Just to add on to, to Jared, exactly. The focus of today's discussion is a bit myopic, right? Just digital health, which often is about how do we optimize <laughs> the care delivery of our current armamentarium of drugs and diagnostics. And then, you know, there's this whole other subset of investors and um, more mature capital around biotech uh, and other things. And so, you know, Alzheimer's is a great example. We need better drugs. We need better diagnostics. Um, certainly the care delivery can be improved, but fundamentally the armamentarium there is, is inadequate. And so I think where we have this kind of scientific or clinical unmet needs, we often look to our peers on the biotech side uh, to get those tools in place that we can then help scale on the on the digital health side. I was just going to throw in. I think everything everything said makes sense. Like we are a little bit skeptical of like the the fourth version of a company or the fifth version of the company without great innovation in in the actual care delivery or infrastructure or whatever sort of category that we're talking about. So I don't want to see the tenth version of dispatch or I don't want to see the tenth version of able to. I want to see the next, um, the next real differentiation from an outcomes perspective with a platform in that space, because at the end of the day, there are only so many ways to scalably commercialize. And once there are, you know, partnerships, behavioral, I think is a great example. Um, if you're just 
if you if you look like Ginger, or you look like Ableton, or you look like Lyra, there are only so many pathways for you to go once those folks are lined up with some of the national payers and employers out in the market. So I think it's a really great question. I think maybe what's less obvious right now, like there is a there is a ton of focus in some of the underserved populations or specialty areas. Probably the space we're seeing the most activity right now is Medicaid. Um, because of how much focus has been in Medicare historically for obvious reasons that Jared pointed out. Um, so a heavy focus in Medicaid. And then you're also seeing like, like Equip raised, announced their fundraise today in the eating disorder space. Like that's a very specialized care delivery model, but a really high need area with not a lot of alternative solutions, not high accessibility historically, and a huge total cost of care number for that population. And you see a ton of investor interest, like one of the probably most competitive rounds I've seen in the last 12 months um, in a space that is very specialized, but is going to have extremely strong outcomes because they have the, they have the ability and they have the sort of total cost of care numbers to innovate from a care delivery perspective in a differentiated way. So I actually think the question is beautiful because there, there is a totally different category of specialized investments that look very different than a very low PM PM number for generalized anxiety and depression, for example, where there's just not as much dollars to play with to innovate from a care delivery perspective. And the outcomes, I think, will look different because of that. We have we have one more question, which is completely related to this. Um, I don't, William, Kim, are you able to ask? I'll ask it, I'll ask it on, on his behalf. He, asked about just what you were saying before, Brenton, like what can big pharma do um, and what role can they play in supporting innovation in the digital health space? Um, and it's a question a lot of folks ask. So I'm curious if you have ideas. Any thoughts on what big pharma can do? Um, so first of all, I think big pharma is already pretty active on this front. Uh, you know, the, the, there's increasingly senior leaders uh, with, you know, digital titles, innovation titles, like they, um, uh, a number of the uh, pharma companies have um, corporate venture arms that traditionally had been very focused on like scouring the landscape for the next kind of early stage molecule to uh, in license in and um, you know, and, and kind of make part of their uh, either development or commercial stage pipeline. But increasingly, uh, those corporate venture efforts on the farm um, uh, from the uh, from those big pharma companies are also uh, doing um, having meaningful focus on, on digital health innovation. Um, and, you know, that's, I think, incredibly helpful. Like there's a number of companies we've looked at or are investors in where uh, a big pharma company's, you know, venture arm is a kind of strategic co-investor uh, and their ability to help get the access for that business to the right people inside and, you know, very analogous to um, you know, Laura Leeds Investments and, and co-leads them and syndicates, but the way that they can do that inside United, which is extremely impactful for companies that, that serve, you know, serve payers, the way that those kinds of uh, investing entities can do that inside a Novartis, you know, or inside Sanofi or inside Johnson & Johnson, um, you know, that has been extremely helpful for the development of, uh, of digital health tools uh, and services that are both directly applicable to pharma uh, or applicable, uh, you know, in sort of a broader sense, but, you know, selling it to payers and providers, but in a way that, hey, you know, if more people are getting access to care and getting on the therapies that they should be, ultimately that's good for pharma too. And, and they're, you know, those corporate venture arms are, um, are cognizant of that point as well. Okay, well, we, are, we have two minutes left. Um, we definitely have more questions, but we have one final question to uh, close out today. Billy? Sure, so uh, this is for everyone on the panel. So what is something that's not getting attention today necessarily, but something that we're likely to know about in the next six to 12 months, where it'll be front and center? All the trade secrets come out now. Oh, come on. I know. You keep it that closely. Give some general knowledge. I have a fun, have a fun one of okay. um, 
Web3, crypto, obviously everyone's aware of crypto, Web3, the Super Bowl, Coinbase ad and all of that. Um, healthcare has always been the laggard by a decade to adopt new technology. So I don't think many folks are looking to healthcare to be an early adopter of that. But um, starting to see a number of companies in kind of the what they call DSI, de decentralized science, uh, on the how to, to fund biotech differently. And I expect uh, to see more and more of those companies, whether they reach their realization and become prominent, uh, all of that remains to be seen, but I'm seeing a lot of activity among entrepreneurs in this space. And I don't think it's going to exclude healthcare. Yeah, I mean, so, you know, the whole concept of health to wealth has been, been around for a while, but I, I, I think you're going to see with the consumer being more and more important in a, in a digital health world, I think you're going to see um, even more convergence between financial services and healthcare uh, mm -hmm. in a way that, you know, tries to empower the consumer to manage both. And I think uh, a big component of that's going to be you know, health equity uh, and some of the inequities that exist um, in that front, I think will be brought to light as a way to manage the kind of health to wealth continuum. Okay. Well, we are just at one o'clock. I uh, don't want to keep you longer. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Billy, for being my co-moderator. Thank you, Laura, Brenton, Pete, and Jared uh, for telling us where the money's going to flow and what to watch out for. So, have a great afternoon and we will see you soon.